<sighs> well, we had some fun last service. Um, I don't know what it is about you guys. You pull the prophetic out of me, which is not, that's not my gifting. It's not my calling. Uh, I am not a prophet by any stretch of the imaginations. Imaginations? Nope, imagination. Uh, but you pull it out of me. Uh, I heard a cool testimony about what happened just a few minutes ago, right before you guys got in here. Uh, praying for one of the, we prayed for people to get the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And here's a secret. We're going to do that again. Uh, so if you're scared of that, lock the doors, guys. We're going to go for it. <clears throat> hey. Hi, Maddie. You know God has a word for you? Yeah, he's going to start agitating you with messages. Like words, messages, like actual teachings. And he's going to keep bugging you with them. And even if you're averse to them... He's going to just keep bugging you until you give them. So, just so you know, I'm telling you, he told me that very clearly. So, he's going to start bugging you. Just anyway, um, <laughs> it works. So, we had this uh, group of people and man, God was all over him. It was really cool. Prayed for some healing, prayed for some uh, infilling of the spirit, prayed for some stuff. But one of the cool ones was uh, there was a lady that was standing about in the middle and she felt... Uh, well, I, I, we, were, we had a bunch of us praying over her, and I was praying over her, and uh, I prayed over her. I said, God is going to show you how to move in the word of wisdom. Specifically, I don't think I've ever prayed that over anyone in my life. But specifically, I, I saw the word of wisdom, and I kept prophesying that she's going to bring the word of wisdom uh, into public offices and all this stuff. She's going to go to places and bring the word of wisdom, right? Well, I didn't know this until after the service, but apparently God woke her up this morning and she felt led to look up the meaning of her name. She didn't know the meaning of her name. And the meaning of her name was Nugget of Wisdom. <laughs> See, that's God literally gift wrapping. He's going, you know that thing that I said? See, this is how prophecy really, for the most part, should work is that God speaks, you, speaks to you in your secret place, speaks to you in the secret places of your heart. And then you get around the body and somebody confirms exactly what God's already said to you and then you know it was him. I'm not saying it's always that way. I'm not saying it's strictly that way. But a good bulk of the prophetic ministry should be revealing what God's already showing you. Confirming. So we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about prophecy a little bit, which apparently is what I operate in when I'm here, even though I very little everywhere else. We'll address that too. <clears throat> so the first service was my guinea pigs. We tried some things. We're going to try some things here too. But first, I want to just wait on the Holy Spirit because, man, how silly would it be to start talking about wanting the Holy Spirit to move and then not give him a chance to move? You know what I mean? So I want you to put your hands out. <laughs> Father, I ask right now, in your grace, come like a rushing wind. Come like a rushing wind. Holy Spirit, come and manifest yourself on individuals, on bodies, in minds, in hearts, in souls. Manifest yourself. Some of you will feel some like electricity. Some of you may feel heat. Some of you may feel cold. Some of you may feel overwhelming peace. Some of you may start thinking very clearly in a way that you weren't thinking before. Some of you might start to feel uh, shaky. You'll notice when I pray for people, sometimes what I do is I kind of like double over. I shake. Uh, it's, it's okay. Don't worry. I'm not clucking like a chicken, okay? It's just when the Spirit moves. Holy Spirit, manifest yourself right now. I ask for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you that as the word is shared, it would come alive to us as if it's being spoken for the first time. We believe in you, God of miracles. We didn't just sing it because it's a cute song. We sang it because we believe it. Ha, and we ask for miracles today. We ask for more healings. We ask for more baptism in the Holy Spirit. We ask for more signs of tongues. We ask for prophetic prophecy. We ask for you to move in power. In Jesus' name. Okay. 
I'm going to read to you uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. And I'm going to try to go as fast as I can because I want to leave some time for us to, to pray. And we got to be out of here because there's a dance recital uh, by a specific time. So I'm going to do my best, okay? There's some things I might not touch on that I touched in the first service. It's going to be different, but it's going to be great, okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. <clears throat> In the original language, the word gifts is not there. It's just now concerning the spiritual. I do not want you to be unaware. We know through context why that was added from translators. It was added to provide some clarity because we know that Paul is about to go on a three-chapter stretch. At the time, they weren't chapters. It was just scrolls. But we know Paul's about to go on a, a three-chapter stretch about the gifts and then love and then the gifts again. And there's no, there's no more robust teaching in the Word about the gifts than 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't get better than that. But Paul starts off his exhortation on this idea of the spirit or spiritual or spiritual gifts. He starts off his exhortation with this phrase, I do not want you to be unaware. Concerning this stuff, I do not want you to be unaware. And um, the word for unaware there, it means <clears throat> to be ignorant, to not know. From lack of information or intelligence, yikes, by implication to ignore through disinclination, a reluctance, or lack of enthusiasm. So some people don't operate in this stuff or know about this stuff or do this stuff because it's never been presented to them. And in the sense, there is some, there is some ignorance there. And ignorance not as a derogatory term, but just in the sense of they've never been exposed to it. I went to ministry school with some kids that didn't even realize that the book of Acts was in their Bible until they got to the school. Because conveniently, what people had done is kind of avoided it because you, you got to talk, you cannot get through the book of Acts and not be convinced that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you'd have to be willfully blinding yourself to what is plainly there. So there's a, there's a sense of like an innocent ignorance, and then there's also a willful ignorance, which is more what it's talking about with the reluctance and the lack of enthusiasm. Concerning the spiritual, concerning spiritual gifts, Paul is saying, I don't want you to sit there and go, ah, not, not for me. I'm not touching that stuff. Paul is saying, concerning this stuff, do not do this. Do not be ignorant about it. Do not be unaware of it. Do not. It's a command. I don't want you to do this because there is power in these spiritual gifts that will only manifest through these spiritual gifts. And so Paul's about to go on this exhortation, but he's saying, listen, you, I can't have you be dull about this. And if you don't hear me say anything else this entire time, what I need you to hear is that we are living in a time where we cannot put these on the back burner anymore. We cannot leave them off to the side and hope that nobody talks about them. That time is done. Matt talked about it in session one. We are moving into an increasingly spiritual world. And it's not going to be any longer through debate that we're talking, athe talking to atheists about the fact that there's a God and debating them with apologetics and going back and forth and becoming more entrenched in our opinions and more hatred towards each other. It's going to be, you are going to be called to help people to discern what is, what is light in the spirit and what is darkness in the spirit because it's all going to be happening. Right. I'm telling you, there is an increased hunger for spiritual things universal, or universally in our nation right now. And one of the saddest things ever that I've encountered, some of you might be stretched by this, but just know, wise as serpents, innocent as doves, right? I'm going to be at a psychic fair in March. We go infiltrate into the psychic fair because you know what they're doing there? They're doing healing, Reiki healing, all that kind of stuff. And they're doing psychic stuff, which is they're trying to tell people their future. And they're charging for it. And so when we say, our booth is completely free, people are like, well, couldn't hurt. <laughs> and then we had so many people come up and say, what you have is different than what everybody else has. What do you have? In fact, we had one lady, she had fibromyalgia. 
prayed for her. She got so significantly touched, she literally slinked down to the floor, like, the, like just lost control of her body and started slithering like a snake across the floor. And we had to be like, nothing to see here, people, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just one of the things that happens. She got delivered and healed from fibromyalgia. Man, can you imagine the open door? See, we don't go, we don't start with blitzing them with, with, with the gospel yet. What we do is we show them the real from the fake. And then we say, do you want to know why it's real? And then we introduce them to Jesus. And one of the saddest things that's ever happened, I've done this a few times, is that we went there and we saw this lady and I went to prophesy over her. And when I started to speak to her, uh, we started getting words for her. They were reading her mail. And she goes, I don't even know why I'm here. I am a Christian. But she was just so desperate for something real in the spirit. Think about this. Somebody that goes, <laughs> somebody that's a Christian, is in the body of believers, was so desperate for something in the spirit that she was willing to go to a psychic fair because it wasn't happening in her body. This should never be. We have access to the unlimited resources of the Holy Spirit. So we're going in March and it's going to be a lot of fun. We had one uh, scenario where this guy that has a healing booth, he manned it himself. So when he had to take a bathroom break, his booth was unmanned. <laughs> so we watched and he had to go take a bathroom break. And so there was a lady that was waiting in line for him to get back from his bathroom break. And so we walked up to her and we prayed for her. Well, we asked if we could pray for her. We said, well, what are you coming here to get healed for? And she told us what it was. And so we prayed for her and she got healed. And she's like, well, I guess I don't need to, I don't need to go to the booth anymore. And she left. I hate taking business from the guy. It was $35 a pop. But, but we got to introduce her to Jesus. <laughs> we are living in a time where we are, there's going to be an increase in spiritual activity and it's going to require the entire body to be discerning about what is happening in the spirit, what is light, what is darkness, and how to move in it. Yeah. And I'm, I promise you, if this makes you uncomfortable, it's a non-negotiable. It, it is happening. Whether we like it or not, if you want to be on the right side of history, it might be time to dig into this word and figure out how to move in these gifts. Because whether we like it or not, it's happening. And I can choose to be increasingly dull about this stuff and pretend that it doesn't exist. And I can let, watch my usefulness in the kingdom just go away. I don't mean that to sound harsh. I mean, for real, we are approaching a time like this. And it, it's a time that already is. People have heard enough of all of the what we're for, what we're against, all that stuff. And, and I believe in standing up for what's right. Believe me. But there's not a whole lot of argument when somebody comes in with herniated discs in their back. You speak to them, they get healed. The debate's kind of over at that point. It's no longer about, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? It's, okay, you're better, right? Yep, you're healed. Okay, you want to know who did that? It's Jesus. You want to know him? The only time I've ever prayed for somebody that they got healed and they didn't respond to the, the message of Jesus when I asked them was I was speaking to this guy's leg pain. It completely went away. And I said, do you want to know how I did that? And he's like, yeah. And I said, it's Jesus. And he took off running. He literally ran away. <laughs> for real. You can do this if you want. But I'm telling you, the time is coming where we, we absolutely have to operate in these gifts. If we don't, we might as well just kiss our effectiveness goodbye. Okay. Let's keep going. Here's the deal. Christianity, I keep tugging on this cable when I get going. <clears throat> Christianity is inherently supernatural. So if the word supernatural or the things of the spirit scare you, you're going to have an issue with Christianity as a whole because supernatural means of or relating to a being outside of the natural world. If you don't believe in the supernatural, how on God's green earth did you get saved? Because you responded in your heart to a being that is outside of the natural world. You don't get saved any other way. You don't get saved by making a mental ascent and just going like, you know what, I've built the case and now I'm saved. 
God moved on your heart, a being that is outside the natural world, moved on your heart in the natural world. You responded to him in faith and you became his child. That's inherently supernatural. And Paul said, the same way you receive Christ, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ? Supernaturally, so walk in him supernaturally. Jesus said, these signs shall follow those that believe. They will cast out demons. And he goes to this whole list. They will speak in new tongues. They will lay on the hands on the sick and they will, I said that weird, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He goes through this whole list and it's those that believe. And so you say, well, I'm a believer. Why don't I see it happening? Because the tense there is continually believe. That means I don't stop believing. Don't even go there. I have this aversion to 80s rock like the Bon Jovi's and all those. I don't know why it makes me feel, ugh. I, just, I know. Some of you, I just lost you. I lost you completely. Come back. Come back. I like some 70s funk. I mean, so, okay. <clears throat> okay. Here's what I want to tell you. You have full biblical permission to run full steam ahead after these gifts. You've heard it said in the past, do not seek the gift, seek the giver. Okay. I get what that means. In your pursuit of him, he tells you, through his word, pursue these gifts. <laughs> Believe me, Paul preached Christ more than anybody. Christ, Christ exalted, Christ risen. He preached Christ, man. And he's the same one that said, hunt down these gifts. Pursue these gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. He gives you full out permission, pursue these gifts. 1231, 1 Corinthians 1231 says, earnestly desire these gifts. So pursue them with everything that you got. Pursue them until they pursue you. I would love to see a whole body of people that just gets all day long. It's just like, oh, here comes a word of knowledge. Instead of uh, us having to be like, oh, I got to get one. Where we're just flowing with the spirit and the spirit just taps on the shoulder and says, hey, that person right there, this is what they need. Twelve eleven says this, for even as the body, oh, sorry, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Some of us, us will use that as a cop out. Say, well, it's just as he wills. If he wants to do the gifts and all that kind of stuff in the, in the church, then he'll do it as he wills. And if that's your mentality, you'll see it once every 50 years. This is in the context of Paul saying, pursue this stuff, go after it. In that context, God will do as he wills. What that means is he'll break out and have his way. But we have a responsibility to pursue I, I, can no, I can no longer accept not walking in power. I can no longer accept attending church, doing the good stuff, and going on with my life. I have, to, I have to get to the point where I do not accept. I will not accept anything other than this manifesting in my life. I promise you, when we get to that place, he does what he wants to. Okay, so I told you to hunt these gifts down and go after them with everything you got, right? There's a flip side to this. And we'll call it the my gift problem. Matt touched on it in week one. I listened to the whole series, by the way. The whole series. So I'm caught up on everything that you guys learned. I did. Matt did it. Week one, money. <clears throat> so he stole some of my ideas, even though he went first. <clears throat> but we tend to present this idea of spiritual gifts as what is my gift over and over and over again. Find out your spiritual gift. What is my gift? What is my gift? What is my gift? My gift. My gift which I don't think there's anything wrong with finding out what your gift is. But he made the point, hey, listen, what if it was, what is the Spirit enabling me to do? It takes the emphasis off of mine and turns it into the emphasis on what does the Spirit want to do? Because here's what we want to do when it comes to these gifts. You want to operate in the gifts that God's given you, but more than anything, you want to find out what he's doing and partner with it to see it come into pass. <laughs> if he's doing prophecy, I want to partner with him to prophesy. If he's doing healing, I want to partner with him to heal. If he's releasing words of knowledge, I want to partner with him to release words of knowledge. The problem is that when we become so my gift, my gift, my gift, my gift, we get pigeonholed into thinking that's the only way that God can work. Or we pigeonhole and try to force our understanding of our gifting into a place where it doesn't belong. The worst offenders of this is prophetic people. If you're prophetic, I love you. I really do. But the worst offenders are prophetic people. 
They'll turn everything into a prophetic get together. Even if it's not what God's doing. I promise you, you don't want to prophesy out of a place of the flesh. You want to say what he's saying. So the problem with the my gift thing is that we tend to go, we tend to take too much ownership of my gift. You will have gifts that you flow in more than others. You will. But our goal is not to make sure that I'm always flowing in what the things that I'm comfortable with because then I pigeonhole him and I, and I think he can only do what I want, what I feel comfortable with him doing. But what God wants to do is he wants to release the, what's needful for the moment. He wants to, if God wants to prophesy, which apparently when I get here, that's what he wants to do every time. <sighs> do something else, Lord. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if there's something that is needful for the moment, it is our job to catch what he's doing and release it. I'm not as comfortable with prophecy as I am with other things. But if it's time to prophesy, that's what I'm going to do. <sighs> okay. Jesus, and I, Jesus operated in every single one of the gifts at some point. He, he, he flowed in all of them. And he said you were going to do greater things. He flowed in all of them. But the goal was not that he would go, you get this one, you get this one, you get this one, you get this one. And then it's like, all right, that's, that's, that's your lot. You just work on that. He was an example for us. You all have permission to flow in every single one of these gifts. You may not flow in all of them all the time. You may not be, have a high level prophetic gifting, but I promise you, if you will yield yourself to him, there will be moments where God will give you a specific prophetic word to speak. And it will be you that's supposed to speak it. Not the man up front, not the woman up front. It's gonna be you. There's a point in Numbers where uh, Moses is getting kind of overwhelmed and there is, everybody's trying to figure out this leadership thing and people started prophesying and they came to Moses and they said, hey, there's people prophesying, we can't have this. And he goes, oh, would that all God's people would prophesy. Moses is like, oh, he's yearning for this day that he didn't even know when it was gonna be. It's called the day that we live in. He was pointing to a Pentecostal reality. Would that all God's people would prophesy. God said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. So each one of you can operate in every single one of these gifts. Now God's going to cause things to happen. You're going to mature in certain ones and you're going to become comfortable in certain ones and people can look to you for those specific ones and it's going to be great. But don't pigeonhole yourself and think, well, this is my spiritual gift. No, because the spiritual gift was not given to you for you. It was given to the body. The Holy Spirit, think of him as the great pharmacist. He has the prescription that every single person needs when you walk in the room. He has the exact prescription. Can you imagine going to a pharmacy that could only fill one order? Wouldn't be a very helpful pharmacy. God knows what every, he knows when somebody walks in and they have hearing loss in their ear, he knows. And all he's waiting for is someone that would go, hey, someone's in here, they got hearing loss. He's like, I want to partner with that. I want to give you some evidence that it's for the body and it's not for you. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says this, So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Your gift is for the edification of the church. When you operate in these gifts, it is to build up the body. We've all been a part of, we've all seen things that get weird where somebody's super gifted in something and then it becomes about their gifting. It's really gross. The only reason you want to operate in these giftings is not so you have a badge of honor. They're not badge of honor. It's called a gift. And the gift is for the body. 14.4 uh, uh, says this, but one who prophesies edifies the church. 26 says this, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble each one as a psalm, each one as a teaching, each one as a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. It's for the body. Listen, if you don't come in here ready to operate in these, you might miss out a little bit and you might miss some edification, but it's really the body that suffers. 12.7 says this, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Now, we need to make an uh, important distinction 
There are offices and there are gifts, okay? There are specific offices where, so we have spiritual gifts, right? God gives spiritual gifts. When someone is is in an office, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, some combine the pastor teacher called the fourfold ministry. Some call it the fivefold ministry. Either way, it's there, okay? Spiritual gifts, you get the gift. The office, they are the gift. Their gift and their grace is specifically, if you are a prophet, your gifting is meant to cause the body around you to raise in their level of prophecy. It is not to be the most prophetic person in the room. The hope would be that you have created such an environment through that office that everyone around you raises to a level of prophecy that surpasses you. Now, believe me, prophets should operate in a high level of prophetic gifting. But the goal of the offices is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. I say that only to tell you, you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. (laughs) You don't have to be a teacher to teach. You don't have to be a healer to heal. All of these gifts are for all of you. I I remember we would run into this issue over and over again. well, it was an issue for me. I didn't think it was an issue for other people. But we had this prophet is coming to town mentality sometimes. We have this prophet that would come in over and over again. And uh, he would come and operate in his gifts. And people would get prophetic words. And they'd be like, "Woo! can't wait till the next time he comes back. And so really what it ended up being is dependent on his gifting. In reality, that's somebody with a high level prophetic gifting. A high level prophetic calling. How you know if you're in the presence of a prophet is your ability to prophesy increases in their presence. You start hearing better. You start prophesying better. You start getting it. it, They have a grace that they release to the body. And it's not a high thing. It's a lifting thing. I have been uh, under the ministry of a real apostle and a real prophet modern day. And I'm telling you, we would prophesy and the accuracy, just the stuff that, man, it was unreal. You'd be like, how did, how is this happening? Because we were under this umbrella of the grace that was released from somebody in an office. But that doesn't mean that you have to be that person to prophesy. Every single one of you can prophesy. We have got to throw away the man of God, woman of God syndrome where we just wait for that person to come in into town and to speak the word. We go, oh, I'm so glad I got to experience prophecy once in my life before I die. I don't think, honestly, I don't think that's what Wimber had in mind either. The father of the vineyard movement, he was so big on activating the saints, on body ministry. It'd be, there's a big difference between someone coming in and operating in their gifts and you going, that's awesome. And us walking in the room and not even knowing who to give the credit to because everyone in there is operating in the spirit. Man, I long for the day where somebody goes, wait, who's, on, who's supposed to preach today? And nobody knows. And God's breaking out to such a degree that we just go, I guess we'll just go after this. <laughs> okay. We get this stuff twisted though, man. And sometimes what we get confused is a nat- our natural gifting and our spiritual gifting. And one of the most dangerous things that I, I see in the body of Christ that happens, it a lot of times happens with worship leaders. If you're a worship leader, no offense, it's not, nothing against you. But they'll be so naturally gifted that their gift can move a room but they're not theologically sound and they get into error and people will follow them because their gift moves them when their gift has been divorced from the spirit. 
And I've watched worship leaders like this fall over and over again and take people with them because the people couldn't discern between a natural gift and a spiritual gift. That's a whole lot more important than what I just said, but let it sit with you, I guess. So, that's not what I, I, I gave you a lot of foundation and then I'm going to go really fast because of what I was supposed to come here to talk about uh, is tongues and prophecy. <laughs> now, realistically, we could go on tongues and prophecy. We could have eight weeks on prophecy. But I'm going to try to do it in like eight minutes. So, <clears throat> what is tongues? It's when God supernaturally empowers you to pray or speak in an unknown or sometimes known language though it may be unknown to you. So there's a few applications of this, okay? When you receive the gift of tongues, okay, there is a personal application, which is me in my own prayer time, my time before the Lord, I can speak, I can pray in a prayer language that is... um, undiscernible. It's not a real language. I pray in the spirit and there's a communication, a direct communication that's happening in the spirit realm that the devil can't understand what's going on. Most of the time you can't even understand what's going on, but your spirit is connecting in a way that's deeper than what happens on the natural level. And so there's a personal application to this. And there are some things in your life that will not get accomplished except through groaning in the spirit, through praying in the spirit. There are some things that just won't come to pass unless it's through that. Then there's also a corporate application. There is an actual corporate application of tongues. Paul makes it very clear that when you get together and you're joined together and you're doing your your whole, uh, you know, uh, corporate worship thing, that if you're going to release tongues, that there should be an interpretation. There's a distinction here, though. It is not saying that if you at your seat standing there worshiping God, you you can freely sing in the spirit. You can freely sing in tongues. If you are praying uh, and you're releasing stuff, you can pray in tongues. But there's a difference between that and taking over the whole service and giving a word to the body. Do you see the difference there? There is a big difference. And if somebody is going to exhort the whole body at once, there must be interpretation. And I've been in services where somebody got up and by the Spirit started speaking out in tongues and somebody said, I got the interpretation and they started interpreting what the person was saying. I've seen it happen. And that's absolutely biblical. Tabby grew up in a scenario where uh, a guy would stand up and start praying in tongues and it was totally out of sync with what was happening and everybody's like, I'll just let the guy finish, I guess. You know? (laughs) Just do it at the most random times. And that's exactly what Paul is speaking against. So it it is all about context. It's all about context. Every one of us can pray, sing, all of it. God, God has made that available for every one of us to use that spirit language. Now, some people are going to move in it to such a degree where they interpret at a high level and they speak in multiple prayer. There there are people that are going to, that's kind of their, their avenue. But I believe the gift is for everyone. And there's another application. There's an evangelism, 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 evangelism aspect to this where I I know of stories of people that went on the missions field, did not, they, they met people, they did not speak their language, they spoke in tongues and the people that they were speaking to heard what they were saying in their native language. So it is a sign as well. Okay, there, there is a sign aspect of this. So there's multiple applications, <clears throat> but what happens is if it is given to the body, interpretation is needed. But we get this idea, I think, when we read this passage that because Paul says prophecy is a superior gift, we kind of poo-poo tongues and put it off in the corner. Just because prophecy is a superior gift because it's easier to edify the body with, doesn't mean that there shouldn't be speaking in tongues. It's he's saying if there is, it needs to have an interpretation. I hope that's making sense. So I want to make a case for you that, that Paul is making because we poo-poo off tongues. And how many of you, you regularly experience people just speaking out in tongues with interpretation? It, it's not a normal, wrong use of that word. It's not typical as what we normally see, but it should be. You want to tell me that a bunch of people 
that got baptized in the Spirit on the day of Pentecost that were speaking in tongues and then went into the nations and they, and they went into the countries and they went into these, these different churches. You want to tell me they weren't speaking in tongues? Listen, no one was saying like, no, <laughs> that's not for today. They probably had the opposite problem. People were coming in and everyone was, ah, and it became this big clamoring thing and they're going, we need to do this thing in order. Right? There needs to be order brought to this because God is a God of order, not confusion. So Paul said this, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues. <laughs> that seems pretty clear to me. I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. 15 says this, what is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. What's Paul saying? It's not either or, it's both and. Paul's exhorting them. He's like, I want you to have both. I want you to sing and pray in your understanding. And I want you to sing and pray in the spirit. In the spirit is a clear reference here to tongues. Verse 18 says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. That's what Paul said. He's like, I'm doing it constantly. And remember, he's the one who said, I wish y'all would do it more. 39 says this, therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not, do not forbid to speak in tongues. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty clear to me. I don't know how people read that and go, we will not allow tongues in our church. Uh, yeah. It doesn't take, you know, a deep understanding of hermeneutics and the study of the word to see when in clear, plain language like that, don't do it, don't forbid it. And somehow it translates into, yeah, don't do it. I, was, I wanted to go to this one university that's here in Kansas City. I thought it would be a great idea. I talk, talked to my senior pastor about it. And he said, well, you know, if you go to that school, they're going to make you sign a piece of paper that says for the next four years, you will not speak in tongues. <laughs> it's a Bible college. <laughs> it's a Bible college. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. <laughs> I don't know how we get here. But I'm telling you, the time is up for us to have that kind of ignorance. So it's clear that Paul has an immense value, but he's prioritizing edification. So he wants the tongues, he wants it to happen, but he wants it to be done for edification. And in order for that to happen, for the body as a whole, there needs to be interpretation. That's all he's saying. He's not saying, yeah, tongues is whatever, if it, <laughs> you know. He's saying, I want it to happen, but we need context. I want you to think about how intimate it is. One of the key ingredients of intimacy is communication. How intimate is it that God made it so that by the Spirit, you would speak to him in a language that only the two of you have between the two of you, that no one else can speak? You think about how intimate that is? It doesn't get more intimate than that. I have yet to meet a single person that got baptized in the Spirit and started speaking in tongues and said, dang it, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Okay, let's go really fast on prophecy. Let me remind you, every single one of you can prophesy. Every single one of you. That doesn't mean every one of you should stand up here at the drop of a hat and give a word to the nations or anything. There's, there's, a, there's a level of practicing this stuff. And I'm telling you, the only way you, gra you grab, nope, the only way you grow in prophecy is by practicing. That's the only way. You will not, you will not grow in prophecy by being like, I hope I get better at this. You're going to have to practice. And you know what practice means? <laughs> it means you're going to fail. Yep. Hebrews talks about those that have had their, their, their senses trained, that by practice have had their senses trained to discern good and evil. That means that there has to be practice. So what that means is all of y'all are going to have to take some risks. Prophesy over each other and be willing to fall flat on your face. Yay. You only grow in prophecy by practice and by discerning and you start giving words and you go, I, I don't know if this, is, if this is accurate, but I feel this, blah, blah, blah. And the person says, like this morning, hey, I see word of wisdom for you. Well, that's crazy because I looked up my name today and it means nugget of wisdom. Okay, that'll work. That only happens through practice. That only happens through missing it over and over again. And then when you feel it, you go, that's what it feels like when he says it. 
And you learn how to discern the difference. So some of you are going to have to be willing, actually all of you are going to have to be willing to fall flat on your face. Are you willing to do that? Okay, so I'm going to boil down prophecy really, okay, so I'm scared of prophetic people most of the time. They're the weirdest people in the body of Christ by far. (laughs) Seriously, I'm I'm being raw with you. Yeah, (laughs) that's the attitude we need. Wherever I go, God goes, right? That's the kind of attitude we need. Prophetic people are scary, for real. And um, so I've been scared of it my whole life, and yet I've benefited wildly from it. (laughs) I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for prophecy. So let's boil it down to make it super, super simple. Prophecy is hearing what God says and saying it or doing it. Releasing it. That can be through word, like what I shared about earlier, at, uh, we did at the, at, the, at the little altar space here. I told the testimony last service, but I'm going to tell it to this, or tell this one to you. One time, God had me do a prophetic act. You ever read the Bible where people do prophetic acts? They can be really weird. <laughs> right? God told me to, we were in this prayer time at our church, and God told me to take a paintbrush and to go over to the tithes and offerings box and just brush 3X on it without doing paint or anything, but just to do it with a paintbrush. And I'm like, whoever sees me do this is gonna be like, oh God, he's lost it. (laughs) He's done, he's gone. And so I went and did that. And I'm like, okay, God. And the next week we took in exactly three times the amount of our highest offering we'd ever taken in. To the number, three times, exactly. (laughs) I'm telling you, God has so many things to say prophetically and he doesn't just want to release them through Matt. He doesn't want to just release them through pastors here. He wants to release them through you. Prophecy, you're either foretelling, which is here's what's going to happen, or you're forthtelling what you're saying is actually causing it. This is where people get scared. It is not name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. It's not that. But sometimes God will give you a word that will actually cause the future. (sighs) Paul gave context here for the church too. He said, don't let a bunch of people, don't have like 19 people in a row give a prophetic word because no one can digest that. He said, let a few go and then let us pass judgment on it. And then he says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, which means you have control. You can hear from the Lord. You can yield and say, this is what the Lord is saying, or I believe that the Lord is saying. This doesn't mean, like some people just stand up and, thus saith the Lord of hosts, and, they, and then everybody's like, this is totally out of control. Like, this is not what, what God's doing. And people go, up. Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Get used to it. That's not how it works. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Okay? So Paul provided some context, but he said, I want you to do this, and I want it to be done in order. But here's the secret that I have for you. Sometimes your version of order Your understanding of order does not look like God's version and his understanding of order. Many of us would have been very offended at the day of Pentecost. Some of us would have been the ones that have said, nine in the morning and they're drinking already. (laughs) But that was the birth of the church. If the birth of the church was this, Why would we think it'd be different 2,000 years later? It's silly to me. So here's what I want to do. This is going to require some people to be brave. It's going to require some people to yield and be willing to take risks, okay? Here's what I want. If you feel, the worship team can come up, if you feel a tug or any sort of pull or you go, even if you're a little bit hesitant and you say, I want I want more. If you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want you to come up. If you have not operated in the gifts, maybe you have been baptized, but you haven't seen a lot of evidence of it, I want you to come up. And some of you, you're going to have this feeling of uh, this white knuckle feeling where you hold onto the chair and you're like, no, I am not going up there. You are the perfect candidate for this morning. Okay, so here's what I want you to do we're going to go into this song, it's going to be about miracles. And we're going to believe for miracles. Does that work for you? You know what's wild? You guys are quieter than the first service. And that's never, I've never seen that. 
since I've been here. Maybe it's you're just thinking. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship, and I want you, go ahead now. Head forward. If you need healing in your body, you want a baptism in the Holy Spirit, you haven't had these gifts manifest in your life, but you want to, or you're super reluctant about it, let's just go ahead and change that now. Okay, come on. Come forward. Not for my sake, for your sake. Don't be shy. Some of you might feel heat. Some of you might feel electricity. Some of you might feel cold. Some of you might feel overwhelming peace. God's going to show himself to you. You're going to feel a sense of presence. I know there's more than this. I know it. I know there is. Just make your way up here. I know. I just know there's more. This is not to make me feel better. I knew it. This is not to make me feel better. We have to have, we have to have the demonstration of the Spirit. We have to have the demonstration of power. We have to. It's no longer an option. If you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're the prayer team. So I want you to come and pray over these people. This cannot just be, I pray for people. That's dumb. I need people coming forward and I need them praying. Okay, so if you have that baptism, I want you to come forward. And we're going to pray for these people. We're going to believe for a filling. And you know what? Even if you don't come down yet, and five minutes from now, you're like, oh, dang it, I should probably go. Get up here. Okay? Let's go into the song.